This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. In timeline history of WWE 1997, Jim Cornette tells the story of how he was training Glenn Jacobs to be the fake Diesel. He watched five or six year matches so he could take notes on your idiosyncrasies. Let's see. He basically wanted me to teach them how to be Razor Ramon and Diesel. I had to go into the TV studio and have uh, Dave Benoit or one of the guys there make me a tape. I said, give me five or six Razor Ramon, five or six Diesel matches so that, you know, I can make notes and tell these guys. I watched them at home, wrote down the moves. Nash, that's where I got the line, six moves. I wrote down every move that Kevin Nash did, every idiosyncrasy he did in the ring, and I got to six, and that was with the hair flip. The back elbow, the side knees in the deal, the fucking flipper punch, the fucking hair. Um, it's side slam. Side, side slam. And, and there's something else. Squisher. It's been 15 years, so... Power bomb, yes. Squisher. There you go. You Snake find eyes. Another, motherfucker. Up till 1996, you go to one of his matches and find him doing something else. So anyway, so anyway, I mean, and that's let me not just say something. So this is guy named just, Nolan Ryan. He was very. He was <laughs> this right there, fucking he piece of shit has a fastball and a curveball. But I mean, granted, I mean, it's really he's got two pitches. <clears throat> so. I mean, Grant L. Gay's got the most no hitters and fucking strikeout king and everything. But this fuck, can you believe the fucking guy has the nerve to fucking just basically live on a fastball? Who the fuck does he think he is? Stephen Ross wants to know if you were to add a sixth move to the move set, what would it be? Probably teabagging Jim Cornette. <laughs> You simply rather shame. So high five. What time is it? N W O. You're listening to Music of the Mat on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 84, and it's about the themes of Kevin Nash. And joining me today is, once again, my good pal and the captain of Voices of Wrestling, it's Rich Kreich. Hello again, Rich. Andrew, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Talk about Big Daddy Cool. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I wanted to have you on this episode is because uh, you were doing a new mini series of sorts on the VOW Patreon called In Your House, In Your House, where you're reviewing the first uh, 19 In Your House main events. And uh, Kevin Nash, as Diesel, is in the main event for a lot of those early ones. Um, not the best made events. I think we can agree on that. Uh, no, one, but, um, one really good one and then a lot of not really good ones. Yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. But uh, why don't you let people know a bit more about this uh, project of yours? Yeah, yeah. So the In Your House, In Your House series is, uh, as you said, uh, just we're, we're covering the main events of the, the first 19, which seems like a very random number, the first 19 In Your House is essentially I didn't really know where to cut it off because technically the quote unquote WWF In Your House goes until like St. Valentine's Day Massacre or whatever. Uh, but the WWE Network nicely does it where they cut it off at DX In Your House. Why they cut it off at DX In Your House? I don't know, but I was like, perfect. There we go. I'll just go with what the network designates as a quote unquote In Your House. We're just going to go with that. Uh, as being the inner houses because it gives us a nice little end date. But uh, yeah, so it's essentially we talk about a lot of what's going on at the at the you know at, uh, around wrestling at the time. And uh, the episode that I, I actually just released by the time most of the people are going to be listening to this is about uh, Shawn Michaels and Diesel in the main event. Uh, really, really great. The good friends, better enemies. One of the the good <laughs> Diesel matches <laughs> in the main events after a lot of lot of really not good Diesel matches uh, in main events. But that time's like super interesting because it's like the NWO is kind of bubbling up. Uh, the aforementioned Kevin Nash has, has given notice to WWF and he's on his way out. He's going to WCW. So uh, we talk about kind of the news of the time as well as the match, of course. We talk about the main event, and we talk about you know my rating on it, what I thought of the match, 
match, reactions to it and that sort of stuff. But it's a little fun. You know, it's like 30 minutes or so, nice little snippets. You get an idea of what's going on at the time in, in, in the company. You know, it's a little bit of what's going on in wrestling at the time uh, as well. And then we talk about a match and, and recommend it. And it's been pretty cool because these are a lot of matches that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, and it seems like a lot of other people haven't seen in a while too because the reaction so far has been pretty cool of people going back and, and kind of rewatching with us too. And then, you know, Sean and, and Triple H obviously realized how popular the series was getting. Uh, and they decided to, you know... NXT takeover in your house, so uh, you're welcome, everybody. That is going to eventually enjoy that show. So yeah, the Rich Crate influence right there. <laughs> I it's I mean, look, they didn't do it, and then I do this in your house series, and now they're doing it. So I mean, <laughs> put two and two together. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, right? Like I don't know if it's co- I don't know if it's causal or correlative, but I'm just saying. Right, but uh, but yeah, I'm enjoying this series a lot. It's a lot of fun, and you know, I, I do feel kind of bad that you had to suffer through those two Diesel versus Psycho Sid matches because. I mean, you know, it's Diesel versus Psycho Sid. It's like watching two redwood trees try to wrestle each other. So. Right, right. Two guys that are good when they're with good wrestlers, but they're not good. So when they're in there together, it's just like, what do we do? <laughs> like, so what do you want to do? Like, ah, how about I just put you in a nerve hold for 20 minutes? Like, poor friend. <laughs> that, that, that's going to work. Let's do that. So. Yeah, but but like you said, at least you had the uh, Shawn Michaels versus Diesel match later on. Yes. Oh, God, that cleansed a lot. And now, and yeah, now 96. Like, I'm, I'm now starting 96 by the time most of you guys listen to this. And that's a lot of really fun stuff. 96, 97 in your house we're good like we got through the diesel <laughs> sid period we, diesel's gone michaels is on top mankind's coming in stone cold's getting hot like we're, we're good we're good for another two years or so yeah there's you know canadian stampede i mean that that entire oh, pay-per-view wait. is like one of the best pay-per-views ever oh, i cannot wait to go to that one yeah i haven't seen that and i for whatever reason i haven't seen it in a while and i'm like i want to jump ahead but i'm like no 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 like build it up build it up build it up but uh yeah i can't wait yeah it's the rich crate special where there are only four matches and they're all at minimum good yeah, so right, it's, right. It's great. Yeah, but um, but anyway, uh, Kevin Nash, uh, he is indeed today's subject. Uh, we'll be talking about his themes as Kevin Nash, as Diesel, as Oz and Vinny Vegas and the Master Blaster, um, Big Sexy, Big Daddy Cool, Big Lazy, as some would call him. <laughs> and it, it's funny, much like with Randy Savage being on Dexter's Laboratory. I believe the first time I ever saw Kevin Nash wasn't actually in wrestling. He was in the Thomas Jane Punisher movie in 2004, where he plays a guy called the Russian, and he's got short bleach blonde hair, and he's built like a big truck, which, you know, no pun intended there, I guess, but uh, but he has a really great fight scene as well with Thomas Jane, and then the first time I ever saw him in wrestling is when he showed up in TNA in like late 2004. Uh, but Rich, I, I'd wager you were first introduced to Kevin Nash a lot earlier than I was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, so my, my early, you know, kind of wrestling watching was a lot of like Saturday morning, Sunday morning WWF shows, whether it be Livewire or Superstars or whatever. So I was kind of aware uh, of, of Diesel from that, you know, really late, I mean, like late period, like we're talking early 96. And I'm, I'm very casually watching at this point. I'm basically putting it on right before uh, Pacific Blue is on because for some reason I really like Pacific <laughs> Blue. And I was like, yeah, yeah, wrestling's cool, but like Mario Lopez is about to be a bike cop. Like, this, <laughs> this is the content I want. Uh, I've, uh, I guess, smartened up. I don't know if I have I smartened up. I don't know. But then I started watching more and more of the wrestling uh but by that point you know i really remember seeing him in wcw for the first time watching nitro uh and and yeah as, as a member of the nwo is, is a pretty big deal uh feuding with the giants is, is probably my most early memory of, of of a real memory of kevin nash uh in wcw so yeah there was that period and then i became a real big kevin nash fan for a while uh during the Wolfpack, we'll talk about it a little bit but yeah i thought like the Wolfpack was the coolest thing in the world and like i'm 11 at that time or 10 or 11 and there's nothing cooler than like you know kevin nash big sexy coming out with you know c murder and the, <laughs> the Wolfpack theme and i just thought he was the best and then you know then i got on the internet and everybody nobody else really liked him and then i realized oh maybe i shouldn't like him either but yeah i like i always have a, a, a semi soft spot for kevin nash like He's not a great wrestler, but he's a dude that absolutely knew what he needed to do and was perfect at doing essentially the bare minimum. To, to, you know what I like? You kind of respect him. Like, I don't know if I love Kevin Nash. I don't really want to watch, like, Kevin Nash matches all the time. Like, if I was on a deserted island, I don't want to get, like, a Kevin Nash comp or whatever. But I always appreciated what he did in the wrestling industry. I think he, he was an important part of it. And, uh, yeah, I always, I always appreciated the tenacity just to kind of do the bare minimum and, and, and make the most money doing it, so... I'm the same way. Yeah, you know, he's a rather conflicting guy in my mind because on the one hand, you've got the bad, boring matches and, you know, as Vince Russo would say, the politics and the bullshit with the click. (laughs) 
and the backstage pull and is pulling WCW and bullying other wrestlers and the vanilla midget comments and all that other stuff that just, you know, it, it clogs up the arteries of pro wrestling. But on the other hand, he's just like a really cool dude. You know, like, he's got the laid-back red wine attitude, and he's really funny and personable in shoot interviews. And, like, during peak NWO, he was just, like, the epitome of cool. Yeah, he'll probably bullshit you, sure, but at the same time, you know, he's just a fun guy to be around. It's hard for me, then, to paint him as just a good guy or a bad guy. He's somewhere in that kind of creamy middle, Rich. Right, exactly. He's like a guy that you 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 kind of don't want to be friends with, but then you just end up kind of hanging out with him a lot because like he gets you to cool places and he's fun to <laughs> hang out with. And when you're done, like at the end of the night or like you know when you're not hanging out with him, you're like yeah, that guy's kind of an asshole. I don't know if I like that guy. But then he calls and you're like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll hang out, man, because you know it's gonna be a good time. Like he always he always seems like he has good times going on. He's always you know and 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 like you said, some guys play politics by you know being very up you know very boisterous and 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 very conniving and all that sort of stuff and and kevin nash's like lack of effort <laughs> almost kind of worked better in his favor because it he seemed like an easygoing guy and then you turn around and he's like booking your company and he just made himself the champion and you're like wait a minute like how'd you do that he's like <laughs> i don't know like you know as he sips his red wine or whatever like wait you just beat goldberg and you're the champion and you're the booker like how'd this all happen and he's like oh, i don't know <laughs> like it just kind of happens you know you don't even notice and all of a sudden he's he's there so a very savvy guy, for sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Knew, knew, how to, knew how to play the game, for sure. Yeah, because there was the MSG curtain call with the click, and WWE was angry with those guys for doing that, but you can't punish Kevin Nash because he's leaving for WCW. So, oh well. And when Vince bought WCW in 01, Nash stayed home and wrote out the rest of his contract. And he skipped that entire shitty invasion angle. And when the invasion angle was over... Oh, look who's back in WWE. It's Kevin Nash. How about that? Hmm. It seems like Triple H is rising up the corporate ranks in 2010 and 2011. Well, that seems like a good time for Kevin Nash to leave TNA, dye his hair black, and come back to <laughs> WWE to take part in the Summer of Punk angle. So, when you think of, like, winners in wrestling, Jeff Jarrett, obviously number one. But Nash has a pretty good record, too, Rich. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and, and like, in one of the more recent, you know, the, the Good Friends, Better Enemies... Uh, episode that I did of, of the inner house in your house uh, you know diesel comes out and he, he's already given his notice this is his last pay-per-view match he's out the door he can leave anytime he wants like he, he's done he's just fulfilling his dates or whatever and he comes out and you're assuming that Vince McMahon as the commentator would be a little solemn he would just basically be like oh here's this big lug you know diesel and you know Shawn Michaels and like yeah he the entire match he's putting over Shawn Michaels but when diesel comes out Vince can't help but just be like it's big daddy cool <laughs> like how cool he is like like you know he's in the, in the back of his mind He's like, don't put this guy over. Don't put this guy over. He's leaving. He's leaving. He's leaving. But he sees the jet black hair. He hears the, you know, the horn that we're going to talk about. And Vince just goes into Vince mode. He's just like, he's big. He's cool. He's big. That a call. He's just like, you know, and this guy's leaving. This guy's quitting your company and going and he's going to be a star in another company. But he, he, Vince can't help but put him over because he's just, he's Kevin Nash. Like, how do you not? It's like, come on, look at him. <laughs> it's like in um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit where every time someone goes, shave and a haircut, Roger goes, two bits, like he, like he can't not do it. And there's a scene where he tries to hold it in, but he, like he'll explode if he doesn't say it. Like that's <laughs> Vince with big wrestlers. Like he, he sees Diesel and goes, must not put over, tall guy, can't do it. No, <laughs> no goddamn it. the hair, it's so wet, his hair is so wet, I love him. <laughs> yeah, it's... All right, so let's get to these themes here. We've got a bunch to get to. Um, some of these songs were played on past episodes and will be featured again. Others were played on past episodes and will not be featured again. Is it arbitrary? Sure. Is it lazy? Absolutely. But, you know, to be honest, Rich, if you're going to do a Kevin Nash episode, you have to be a little lazy, right? Just, oh, just to course. honor the man's yeah. legacy. Oh, my God. Yeah, our patron saint of laziness here, Kevin Nash. Of course you got to leave some stuff out or, you know, just kind of hand-fisted, like, go through some of these. Yeah, no, you got you to get a little lazy, man. That's, uh, he, that's what Kevin Nash would have wanted. Kevin would have wanted us to be lazy, so. Yeah, listen, Kevin Nash walked... So Randy Orton, um, maybe not run, but also walk, you know, also so walk, yeah. walk slower somehow. Yeah, right. Uh, actually, there's a great story that the Young Bucks tell in a shoot interview they did with Kevin Steen one time where they were in uh, TNA. They were wrestling Nash and Eric Young on a house show loop. And the finish of every match was Nash hitting one of the Bucks with a big boot, like out of midair and pinning them. And like every time Nash would whiff on the big boot. And, like, finally they ask him, like, 
you know you're missing these big boots. Like, are you okay? Is something wrong? And Nash just goes, it's a house show. I'm not making contact (laughs) with you on a house show. There are no cameras here. Who cares? And I just, I love that story so much because it's so Kevin Nash, you know, like, dude, it's a house show. Who cares? You're still getting paid. Like. Right. And, and, and that's the best part about Kevin Nash is like, you could say, oh my God, what a lazy asshole. Like, you know, those people paid money to see you, but then you're also like, yeah, it's a house show, man. Like, it's true. No one's going to ever see it. And like, it doesn't really matter if he doesn't make contact. Like, huh. And, th- and that's the conundrum of Kevin Nash where you're like, oh, what an asshole. And then you're like, oh, but he's, he's right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, who, why do you know the Bucks are out here trying to die every single night and get you know stiffed by you know Kevin Nash's boot? And he's like, no, nah, man, dude, just fall down near my leg and it's good. <laughs> like, we're good, man. God, I love him. What a what a what a what an unbelievable human being that Kevin Nash is. A lazy icon, that's for sure. That's <laughs> for sure. So uh, our story begins, as all good stories do, in 1990 WCW, where a young Kevin Nash comes into wrestling as one half of the tag team, the Master Blasters, as Master Blaster Steel. And then when the team broke up in 91, he was simply called the Master Blaster. His theme song, because it's WCW, is from the Telemusic Library. It's by Slim Pezin, which is a great name, by the way. It's called Southern Rock. So this is your standard hard rock guitar wrestling theme, pretty much a dime a dozen in WCW, as this podcast can attest to. Uh, kind of reminds me of Danger Zone from That's the opening bit. Exactly, my note is very Danger Zone. Very, it just almost sounds exactly like Danger Zone. Very like close your eyes and think of a rock song from 1989, and that's Southern Rock. Yeah, it has that same like driving oomph to it. Um, similar to like Blackout by the Scorpions in a way mm, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, a, a decent song, but not one that you'll remember all that well, really. Um, I mean, it was called Southern Rock for God's sake. You know, not the flashiest title there, Rich. <laughs> no, certainly not. Yeah, it's so it's weird. It's like it, it kind of has like you said, like the opening montage of an action movie that came out in 1989. Uh, it's it's I mean, it's a decent jam. It's not bad. It's good wrestling music, but like you said, unfortunately, it, it doesn't stand out in any way, shape, or form, especially in this early era of, of, you know, this early 90s era of WCW, where seemingly everyone's theme was, like, almost the exact same, just slight derivative of just rock, you know, montage action movie song is, is pretty much what every one of these ones were. So it fits right in with that, which is both good and bad. It fits it with the mo- kind of the motif of the company at the time or the kind of the theme of the company at the time, but also everybody had this almost exactly the same theme that makes it tough for anybody to really stand out. I mean, it definitely works for the Master Blasters. You know, these these are big, tough guys with the face paint and the mohawks. Uh, the name comes from Mad Max 3. So, yeah, the, the big, heavy rock song does work, sure. But, again, it's a song that doesn't really stand out amongst the pack as this, like, amazing thing. It's just, you know, a decent rock song. Um, and much like other WCW themes, this was used by other wrestlers, too. Um, the Motor City Madman, Rick Steiner... Um, the Diamond Stud, a.k.a. Scott Hall. Yeah, which... I love that little note there. Diamond Stud and Nash, you know, linked as early as, you know, in the 90, early 90s here at WCW. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the Skyscrapers tag team as well, which uh, included some guy named Mean Mark Callis, who, you know, kind of sounds like a jobber to me, Rich. I don't know. Yeah, I got, that's not going to work. That's not going to go anywhere. Mean Mark, get out of here. But, uh, no, I got, like that also speaks to it as well, is that, you have a guy called the Master Blaster. You have a guy called the Diamond Stud, the Skyscraper, and they're all using the same thing. There's just like it's just an innocuous like rock song, you, you know. And that, and that's something that WCW always suffered with, almost till their you know final days, is that songs never really felt unique or felt felt of those characters because they just kind of picked them out of a music library and said, here, there it is, that's good enough, go ahead. And and that you know that always hurts these guys. Is is you know a theme should feel like it fits 
the character fits the guy is unique to the guy and, and and in wcw so often it didn't and it was just a theme that could be used by anybody on the roster at any point yeah how many luchadors in the late 90s came out to you know mexican song number 12 or whatever right so. right or yeah i mean the Rey mysterio theme which like you, you go back and watch like you know any wcw on the network from like 1991 until yeah w- r- until Rey mysterio gets like you know the, the filthy animals theme the same thing we talked about in a prior episode with the Rey Mysterio one. The dun, 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 dun. I forget what the name of it was. The March or something like that. March like of Dem- Death. Yeah, March of Death. Like, Dean Malenko had it. Rey Mysterio had it. Like, a, a thousand guys had it. Like, Ultimate Dragon had it. It's just like, jeez. It's like, and that and that, that hurts. To me, that honestly hurts because it doesn't let the characters really, doesn't let the music tell the story of the character. And that's what WWF did so well for so many years. So in May of 91, the Master Blaster goes away. And uh, soon after, who shows up at Super Brawl 1? But Oz, based on The Wizard of Oz, of course, because in 91, uh, Turner Broadcasting got the TV rights to the MGM library, which included The Wizard of Oz. And in a wonderful bit of synergy, the Turner execs went to WCW and said they wanted a character based on The Wizard of Oz. So Kevin Nash put on that lime green robe and those lime green pants and that bearded old man mask and the pointy hat, and he became Oz. With one hell of an entrance, too. The first Oz theme debuted when Oz himself debuted at Super Brawl 1. This is also from the Telemusic Library. It's by Christian Chevalier, and it's called Chariots of Rome. So if you're doing a wrestling character like Oz, um, for his music, I'd imagine that you want something that is, you know, kind of epic, kind of grand in scale, um, cinematic perhaps, something majestical that will capture the audience's imagination. And Chariots of Rome, it's a very ominous sounding song, very foreboding. And I don't know if it's really epic, but I do like how it ramps up and becomes more and more frantic as it goes. And it builds this, you know, manic fever pitch that works for a big scary villain like Oz. It does sound a bit cheap though, you know? Like, it's a bit subpar in terms of the production, I think, and that's where it really, you know, falters in that regard, Rich. Yeah, that's really where, where my, my big notes here. I mean, I, I think it's a decent music for like a mysterious character. I don't know if my Oz, I mean, I know Oz was supposed to be mysterious, but it's like dark mysterious is how this was, and I, I guess I don't know what they wanted to go for with Oz, and I guess that is true of the entire character itself. It's like all like a good idea, yeah, it's Oz, it's the Wizard of Oz, and then they're like, okay, what do we do? And they're like, oh, I don't, I don't really know what to do. So uh, th- that kind of stinks uh, about it. I don't know that they had quite uh, a full idea of what Oz was supposed to be or what he was going to be, but yeah, like I, I guess it works for mysterious character, but like you said, it's very low quality in terms of the instrumentation. It's like it sounds like it was done. With the lowest, like the lowest quality keyboard you could find, it, it almost feels like the loading music for like a Genesis game, like a Sega Genesis game, in a sense. But it's like, no, you don't need to use like eight bits or sixteen bits, guys. Like you can, you, you know, you can, you don't need to have a sound card. It's like just music that blares over the speakers. Like it could be high quality. It could be, and and it's very different from like you know Southern Rock, which you know for whatever you want to say about it, at least it sounded like a real song. Like you could buy that Southern Rock was a song that you would hear on the radio. This thing sounds just like really bad. Again, like it sounds like video game loading music. Uh, and that kind of stinks for uh, a major company at this time to, to to use. Yeah, if this was like a full orchestra doing this, you know, whole big thing, I think it would work a lot better. But when it's just, you know, Casio keyboards, it does hamper the quality quite a bit. Um, you know what's funny, though? If you take out the trumpets, you know what this kind of sounds like? Sting's theme. Hmm. 
na na. It does have that same sort of sound. Interesting. Yeah, you're right. Because yeah, the, the trumpets really like they overbear. I mean, it, it's and like they're like burr, 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 burr. they're like these really terrible sounding <laughs> like like it sounds like a guy got on a microphone and was just like uh, make a trumpet sound and then and that's what he made. But uh, you're right. Yeah, it does kind of have a very similar uh, to to the sting theme which which again and again i think that song works better for sting than it does for an oz if i'm assuming what oz is supposed to be in the wcw but it kind of seems like nobody i I always had this theory about wcw is that i don't know if like the dusty Rhodes ever or whoever was booking at the time did they ever like watch the wizard of oz like (laughs) did someone just describe what oz kind of was to him and he's like i got it baby good sounds good it's like because like it doesn't really make sense like he's some old guy that comes out in like uh, and then he takes his wig off, and he's just a dude that wrestles in green pants. It's very doesn't make any sense at all. But it's WCW 1991. It's it wasn't supposed to make sense. So. Right. It's very strange, and that debut entrance too is just ridiculous. I mean, you got this like big castle gate set on the stage, <laughs> and they hired actors to portray the characters from Wizard of Oz, and Nash is just dressed up in this full getup, and he's on this little platform with his back to everybody. And as he's slowly turning around, this, like, shitty voiceover goes, I will show you who I really am. (laughs) And the characters all run away scared. And his manager, the wizard, uh, the great wizard, who was Kevin Sullivan, is parading around him. It's just, it's so ridiculous and so over-the-top cartoonish. But then again, that was Jim Hur WCW. You know, there was just so much of that cartoonish stuff just put into the company, like the Ding Dongs and Arachnaman. There was just so much of that weird crap at the time, Rich. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's 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 odd, and yeah, it's the whole Oz thing was odd, and thankfully it didn't last very long. It didn't didn't ruin his career either, so that's I guess good. Well, we're not done with Oz yet. Uh, so, Chariots of Rome becomes a prologue theme of sorts when Oz gets his second theme. This is by Robert Bradford Keyes from the Aircraft Music Library. It's called Ride the Bus. So as I'm sure many people would guess with this theme, uh, the bass line is ripping off a very famous Queen song, Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> right, of course. Oh, no, no, I'm oh. kidding, of course, I'm kidding. It's another one bites the dust. And if I'm not mistaken, the title Rides the Bus comes from the Weird Al Yankovic parody, Another One Rides the Bus, which is a bit weird, I think. But regardless, I, I do have one burning question when it comes to this song, and I think you do too, Rich. What in the blue hell does this have to do with Oz? Uh, yeah, my, my notes here say I have no idea why this is Oz's theme. I don't know why Oz existed. I don't know why this is Oz, Oz's theme music. I just don't know, Andrew. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I just don't understand why it exists for Oz. I understand why it exists. Like, hey, you know, somebody in this library needs, uh, uh, you know, a, a ripoff of Another One Bites the Dust for whatever the hell they're going to do. And they don't want to pay the rights to Queen or whatnot. So, okay, yeah, you have to ride the bus. You can use it, but why did they decide? Yep, here we go. <laughs> this is gonna work. This is gonna work for Oz. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I have no fucking idea why this was used for Oz. It's like, yeah, he's Kevin Nash. He's a big, tall powerhouse guy who will have this type of rock song for the majority of his career, sure. But it's not Kevin Nash. It's Oz. You know, he's he's a mystical, magical character from another land. Why, why is he coming out to you know butt rock number seven? It's so weird, Rich. Yeah, and this is during the weird period, too, where Oz, like, they realized that the Oz thing wasn't working, so they, like, repackaged him as, like, a different type of guy, but he was still called Oz. <laughs> it was like, okay. It, it, uh, trying to trying to figure out why WCW did things that did is 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 very difficult, so it's, it's probably best we move on and just not think of it ever again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe the Kevin Nash laziness spread to the production people. Who knows? <laughs> right, maybe, right. maybe that's why. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, Oz does not make it past the new year. Uh, he fucks off back to the Emerald City, never to be seen again. But who does show up in 92 to take his place is Vinny Vegas, a wise, cracking good fella who wears sunglasses and a black suit jacket with pink lapels and a pink pocket square. And he talks like this. Hey, how you doing? It's the Vin Man. Van Hammer, Big Josh, I'm going to kick you guys' butts. Just a, just a pitch-perfect Goomba accent there. And uh, Vinny Vegas' theme is also from the Aircraft Music Library. It's by Dan Katamartori and William Allen Bookheim. It's called Van Gogh. Not the artist. That's <laughs> V-A-N-G-O. Not much to say about this one. Again, it's a decent hard rock instrumental. I will note that compared to Southern Rock and Rides the Bus, it does have a slightly slower groove to it. It's not as frantically paced as those other two are. And that actually does lead nicely into the rest of Kevin Nash's themes because, you know, those do have a much steadier pace to them. Which, you know, Kevin Nash, not known for being a speedster, I don't think. <laughs> right, <laughs> tends right, to, right. Tends to lumber a lot. So I think tempo-wise, it does work for his measure of walking and wrestling. For Vinny Vegas, the Goodfellas ripoff, eh, maybe not so much, Rich. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. It's, it, again, it's another really good... I, I like the song a lot. Like, the song On Its Face and in, in, in a Vacuum is pretty good. It's pretty solid. I just don't know about... I just don't know if it works for Vinny Vegas. It's not... I, I don't know how to describe it. It's not Vegas enough. I, I think you get it. You understand. Anybody that knows, like... What Vinny Vegas, the character, is supposed to be, and here's the song, knows that it's just not, it's just not Vegas enough. I don't know what, I don't even know what exactly I want instead. It's just, it just doesn't feel right. I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like he needs a party anthem or he needs like, there's, there's some, like, you know, more big, more brass in it or something like that. It's just a little too kind of rocky for what I think Vinny Vegas uh, was kind of portraying his character as being. Yeah, it doesn't really scream Vegas. You're right. It can kind of go for any number of gimmicks and wrestlers. Um, but on the other hand, like, it is a bit tricky, I think, to give him a Vegas type of song. Because what do you give him? The Casino Zone music from Sonic? <laughs> or, yeah, like, like, yeah, or you give Sinatra, him like Cabernet. Or, yeah, like Frank Sinatra Cabernet. Like, that doesn't really Luck work. Luck be or... your lady tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it does work. I don't know. Does it? I don't know. Does it? I don't know. But it's not like he's a Vegas showman. You know, he's supposed to be a Vegas tough guy. Right. And I don't right. know if the typical, like, you know, flashing lights Vegas music can really work for that kind of gimmick. You're right. Yeah, I, I, you're right. Yeah, that that's true. He wasn't. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, the, the putting you know, it, nailing down this theme is is tough for him, and it's tough for this Vinny Vegas character. I think I like this theme, and I think I like it for Vinny Vegas. But there's also times where I do think that they could have done it a little bit different. But this is, I would say, of the themes he's had in WCW, I think this one fits his character the best, and is probably my favorite of the of the song so far. Right, right. Um, I, I do have a fun fact for you about this song. Uh, William Allen Buchheim did some other WCW themes. He did the Chris Jericho Evenflow ripoff. Oh, there you go. Nice. Nice. And he also did La Parka's theme, which was also Sabu's theme. So there you go. Well, 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 Brett. I said any time, any place, anywhere, just as I suspected. Brett Hart, you named the time and the place. Tampa, Florida, January 22nd. Royal Rumble. Pay-per-view. You know, Brett, I'm real sorry about what happened to you at the Survivor Series. But you know, your misfortune was to my advantage. And Brett, come Tampa, you're coming for something that was dear, dear to you. But let me tell you something, it's become very dear to me. 
So if you think Royal Rumble, you're going to walk in and reclaim what was once yours, Big Daddy Cool's got other ideas. See you in Tampa, buddy boy. So in mid-93, uh, Kevin Nash says goodbye to WCW for now and heads on over to the greener pastures of the World Wrestling Federation, where he becomes the new bodyguard for Shawn Michaels' Big Daddy Cool Diesel. And Diesel's first theme can be found on the very rare cassette tape, WWF Ringside Favorites. This is by Jim Johnston, and it's called Diesel Power. <laughs> So this starts the way that the more well-known diesel theme starts, which is, you know, the truck starts, the engine starts purring, and the horn blares. But instead of going, the engine just keeps purring, and the horn just keeps blaring, and more purring, and more blaring, and that's it. That's the whole song. I mean, it's not even a song, really. It's just a series of truck noises over and over again. And, and, and listen, I get it. He's Diesel, he's a truck man, but this is not a fun thing to listen to at all, Rich. Not, not at all. <laughs> no, this is bad. Yeah, this is really, really bad. It, it's it's very annoying, and I don't know if they were just, like, trying to go for, like, the most heel heat humanly possible for, for Diesel or something. <laughs> I don't know, but, man, this is... I, I I I guess I never you know I I go back and I watch some of those you know early you know diesel stuff and for me it never I, I guess it never stuck out to me that yeah there was never any instrumentation I think maybe my brain just added in diesel blues which we're gonna talk about here in a sec I think my brain maybe just said no 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 that's what it is it's diesel blues and like my I, I don't know I just guess I always thought that there was music to this but you listen to this one and it's just like oh my god <laughs> like it's what's what's also notable too is just how shitty the truck noise is. And how shitty the horns is. Like, you can visualize Jim Johnston with, like, a tape recorder walking out to the WF ring truck and being like, yeah, start it. And they're like, all right. And he's like, all right, perfect. So like, let me just do that for a bit. Okay, can you hawk the horn? And they're like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, whereas in, like, Diesel Blues, everything seems a little more mixed. It seems a little bit better. It's, like, professional, you know, you know, fully recorded or whatever. Whereas this one, like, it's just very low quality and just, yeah, not very good. And, and yeah, you keep waiting. Like, I, I, I don't know about you, but, like, I forget how long the track was. But for some reason in my brain, I'm just thinking, okay, at two minutes in, it's going to start having some sort of beat to it. It's going to have to start some music to it. And no, it's just... <laughs> it's like, it's very annoying. And he used this for like, I think, longer than he even used the Big Daddy uh, Cool thing or the Diesel Blues. Uh, he had so, it for a while. Like it, yeah. It's nuts. Yeah, I, I, I don't... It's a... Uh, one of the a terrible themes. just <laughs> a god-awful theme, but... <laughs> yeah, but uh, Jim Johnson is going to redeem himself here shortly, so... Yeah, I'd like to imagine, like, nerdy Jim Johnston recording those truck noises and then, like, going back to the studio and being like, you know, okay, this goes over here. Can't have too many horns in this stanza. Gotta move those over there. You know, just just like total nerd music stuff for truck noises, you know. But, but yeah, this is not good. Not good at all. Um, you know what's always kind of bugged me about Diesel in general, about the character? He's called Diesel, and he's supposed to be like a trucker, you know, from Detroit, the Motor City. Yes. He does the truck driver, horn blaring arm motion. Okay, I get all that, sure. But he's wearing like an open leather vest, leather <laughs> gear with a fringe on the legs, sunglasses, the one black glove. It's more of a biker look than a trucker look. And I mean, the, the, the biker look is a lot cooler than the trucker look, sure. But still, it's always kind of befuddled me that they called him Diesel. His theme song is Truck Noises. And yet he skews heavily towards the biker motif. Did that ever bother you at all, Rich? No, but now it does. <laughs> Damn it, Andrew. <laughs> all, all my life, I, I've ne no, I've never thought of that. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, he he's dressed like a biker, looks like a biker, acts like a biker, but he's supposed to be a trucker. Even though, like, yeah, if he was a trucker, he'd have like you know a plaid, you know, button up, unbuttoned, and like you know a big gulp and a hat on. But yeah, no, he's he's definitely he's cool like a biker. But yeah, oh my god, and no, I never thought of that until just now. Thanks. Now I'm never going to be able to unthink about it. Great. Sorry, sorry. Great. great. 
<laughs> yeah, the gloves. Like, why would he have, like, I guess some dry, uh, truckers have gloves, but he's, they're definitely like biker gloves. God damn, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> Man. But, uh, but, but at least Kevin Nash did get to be a biker eventually with the Road Wild pay-per-views. At least it That's was That's true. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, so Diesel wins the WWF title in November of 94 in very quick fashion by beating Bob Backlund. Um, actually, another fun fact here. Until CM Punk broke the record in 09, Diesel had the record for winning the Triple Crown in WWF in the shortest amount of time between winning the first belt and the third belt because he won the IC title in April of 94, then the tag belts in August with Sean, and then the world title in November. So that's 227 days, and then Punk did it in 203 days. But Diesel had the record for a very long time. And not just that... He was WWF champion for about a full year, too. And when you're champion for that long, you can't just have a crappy truck sounds theme for you, right? No, <laughs> you need a proper theme. So in January of 95, Diesel got a new song, also by Jim Johnston. It's off of WWF Full Metal, the album. It's called Diesel Blues. <laughs> big he's cool he's big daddy cool now this is a goddamn diesel theme rich because you still got the truck noises in there in the opening and the horns but instead of playing that ad nauseum now you've got actual music which tonally and pacing wise is a perfect match for diesel because it feels like there's some heft to it you can picture Diesel in your mind, like I said, lumbering in time with the music. Mm-hmm. There's the classic blues riff, da 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 which is pretty badass. And there's, of course, the harmonica, which gives it a bit of spice to it, too. So Diesel power can hit the bricks because Diesel Blues is the proper Diesel theme, Rich. Oh, my God, yeah, this theme is so great. And you can say whatever you want about Diesel at this time and, and, and about the, being the champion and whatever he was, but, like, this is a jam, man. This is an incredible theme that just – we talk about – you know, there's there's good songs, and then there's songs that really match the wrestler. I think this is both. I think this perfectly matches Kevin Nash, like you said, or perfectly matches Diesel at this time because it lulls you in. It's slow. It fits exactly with the pace. And, and Jim Johnson has talked about that before where, where he would sometimes feel and kind of like know how the guys walked, and he would sort of cater the music to how they walked. Stone Cold doesn't walk the same way that Mankind walks. Mankind doesn't walk the same way that Diesel walks. And this one – it, it looks like he's got a video of Diesel walking down to the ring next to him, and he's just like every note hits like at a perfect time for Diesel's walking, and Diesel you know can walk to it as well. And like you said, it just it's lumbering, it's heavy, and it just yeah, it's all time great song character relationship. You know, you mentioned the, the, the blues beat, which is great. I love the harmonica too, because and and they don't over the harmonica is not overbearing either. It comes in at like just the right time, like just when you're kind of getting sick of the blues beat a little bit, you get the screeching of the harmonica, and it's just like, God damn, what a theme song! And you don't <laughs> want this guy to ever get in the ring because it's like it's all gonna go downhill once the bell rings. But like, God, he's, he's yeah, there's smoke coming out. Vince McMahon's screaming. He's wet. He's got you know his cool gloves on. The crowd's going semi nuts, sort of, <laughs> and like it's just it's oh my god, it's perfect. Yeah, it just exactly fits. It's it's an iconic wrestling theme. I, I really do think so. It's it's just that good. Yeah, I first played this uh, way back on the Kane episode because Kane was of course fake Diesel, and what? I, I described. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I ruined Christmas for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I describe this song then as industrial blues because like, if you close your eyes. You can picture in your head like factories and smoke and trucks and sparks flying and 
blue collar towns and blue collar workers and Diesel being a truck man wasn't this fancy schmancy character by any stretch you know he was a nitty gritty guy from the Motor City he always entrance video started with that big loud smoky truck coming towards the screen so yeah it really does fit the character quite well and like you said earlier this is the benefit of having a Jim Johnston in your company because he can actually make a theme that fits the character. Yeah. Like those earlier WCW library songs, yeah, they can fit because Kevin Nash is a big powerhouse guy, sure. But this song is like 100% a song for Diesel, that specific character, because Jim Johnston, you know, wrote it that way. And I do feel bad for wrestlers in WWE right now because A, WWE sucks, and, and B, they don't have a Jim Johnston or a CFOs even to really sit down and make a song for them. They just have some, you know, poor schmuck intern who has to call through library songs and put together a theme. It, it really does suck for those guys, Rich. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, yeah, it, 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 having a guy like that I think is so important. I think every company should, and, and and I don't need to tell you, you know this, and most people listening to the show know how important wrestling theme music uh, is, and I think a lot of companies just kind of, they don't give it as much care. AEW is doing, a, I think, a pretty decent job of it. Uh, WWE, in varying times, does a pretty good job of it. Uh, right now, eh, I don't know about right now, but uh, it's so important. And it's like, it, you know, when CFOs was on the top of their game, like, it was obvious that, like, their songs were just matching perfectly with the characters. When Jim Johnson was on the top of his game, uh, when Jimmy Hart was on the top of his game in WWF and stuff. It's just like, yeah, it, it, it it's such an underrated, but uh, underrated by most people. But, like, the people that know, like, the people that know how important that is, is, is it's 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 just it's so valuable to have that guy can do that right and uh yeah this is a great song not much else to say about it really um really the only thing better than this song is the diesel title reign itself because that was just you know home run match after home run match rich i mean ryan I mean, oh it was on. unbelievable yeah they, they, they didn't call him big daddy cool because he was cool they called him big daddy cool because god he's those those in-ring masterpieces that he had uh just just incredible so i i deplore everybody that's that's listening to this go back and watch every diesel main event in 1995 you will just be rewarded handsomely <laughs> and the business success too i mean my goodness oh my god yeah <laughs> they still talk about it today so nothing says wrestling boom quite like ham sandwiches and catering you know <laughs> right. or, or high school gymnasiums or, or taping routes in high schools yes exactly <laughs> right. exactly <laughs> just the wildwood resort is where uh where dreams happen on monday night Raw. <laughs> all those auditoriums all those civic centers just the absolute peak right there i mean he was champion for a year a year. I mean, like like Vince McMahon, a guy notorious for changing things up on the fly and scrapping plans like that. It, he stuck to his guns with Diesel as champion for a year with business going the way it was. I mean, that that is the power of tall, big men to Vince McMahon, Rich. It, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. Tall men, black, wet hair. You, you're good for a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, the comparisons between Roman Reigns are there. Like, there's there's an aesthetic and there's a look. And, and Vince... God damn, he was determined to make Diesel work, and uh, eh, it just didn't. Out of curiosity, I looked up some numbers. Um, since the Hogan era ended in like 92, 93, there have been only five people who have been world champion for a year or more. Cena, Punk, Lesnar, AJ, and Diesel. And, and that's it. <laughs> so, you know, Big Daddy Cool, he's in good company. Oh, for sure. Yeah, unbelievable. Where is it? The big surprise. I mean, I heard a lot of talk, but where's the walk? What? I'm here. Where is it? You've been sitting out here for six months running your mouth. This is where the big boys play, huh? Look at the adjective, play. We ain't here to play. Now he said last week that he was gonna bring somebody out here. I'm here. You still don't have your three people. And you know why? because nobody wants to face us. This show's about as interesting as Marge Schott reading excerpts from Mein Kampf. No trouble here tonight, man. Speak your piece and hit that. Yeah, no trouble, because you know I'll kick your teeth down your throat. 
Where's your three guys? You what, you couldn't get a paleontologist to get a couple of these fossils cleared? You ain't got enough guys off a dialysis machine to get a team? Yeah, where's Hogan? Where's Hogan? Out doing another episode of Blunder in Paradise? Where's the macho man, huh? Doing some Slim Jim commercial? Hey, we're here. You want to say something? Look, I don't have the authority right here, right now. You want to fight? Fight is it with me. You want three guys? Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'm going to be in Atlanta. I'll be in the offices of WCW. I'll try and get you your fight. And you know what? Live this Sunday in Baltimore, Great American Bash. You guys want to show up? You want to fight? You show up. I'll see if I can get you your fight. I don't know about you, but hey, they love us in Baltimore. Hey, hey Big Man, I say me and you, we'd be at the Bash. Maybe these punks want to fight. Yeah. I'll be there. Bring what you got. The measuring stick just changed around here, buddy. You're looking at it. So Diesel leaves the WWF in May of 96, and where does he go next? With his buddy Scott Hall, back to WCW, where they show up as the outsiders, as these invaders who are going to take over the company, because WCW, that's where the big boys play. Look at the adjective, play. Uh, (laughs) And at Bash at the Beach, Hall and Nash revealed their third man, their mystery third partner, who turned out to be Hulk Hogan, who turned heel... And together, the three of them started the New World Organization of Wrestling, brother. The NWO, the New World Order, as it was actually called. One of the biggest stables and storylines in wrestling ever. And the iconic NWO theme, the one that everybody remembers because, well, they played it 50 times the Nitro, is from the Focus Music Library. It's by Frank Shelley. This is Rock House. <laughs> So very early on in the podcast, we did an NWO episode where we talked extensively about this song and the next one too, of course. And for good reason, because this is one of the greatest and most iconic themes in wrestling history, I think. I mean, when you've got the NWO coming out and there's like 20 guys there and they're running the show and beating up all the good guys, they look like the biggest bunch of cocky and confident badasses around. They're the coolest dudes. So you need a song that conveys all that. And I think Rock House does that job just tremendously. It's just, it's dripping with swagger and coolness, which given that it's made up of Jimi Hendrix riffs, it makes sense then because he's one of the coolest guitarists ever. You know, it, so it's just, it's really a perfect match between the stable and the theme, Rich. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not much more that needs to be said uh, about Rock House, but um, yeah, it's just an, a great all-time theme. And it fit those guys perfectly, like you said. It feels chaotic. It feels like it's taking over. It feels like it. It, it just, yeah. It, it, it just, it, it's everything you want out of that theme, and and it's just so perfectly aligned with what the NWO was, what they were going to be, the takeover, the the just, yeah. It's just an annoying theme, but it's also catchy as hell too. And that's kind of what the NWO was, you know, in a lot of ways. It's like these guys are assholes. They suck. They're the worst, you know. But you can't help but love them, and like that's how everybody kind of was. The fans all were is, is they were supposed to hate these guys, but you end up kind of loving it, and that's how the song is too. You're like, this song's annoying. You're like, ah, I hate this song, and then like you listen to it for another minute, or you listen to it again, or it happens again, and you're like, actually, it's pretty damn great. <laughs> it's a pretty awesome song, and uh, I thought it really, you know, the, the added sound bites really poke it, uh, you know, I, I think bring it up a notch uh, as well because 
you know, in later years when they added, you know, the we're taking over and the oh yeah and the you know we like, are in control. Yeah, right, we, that's we, we are <laughs> in know, control. It's, perfect. it's so good too. It's just like yeah, it, it, it adds an annoyance to it. It's like these cocky motherfuckers. Like they had to add all this sort of stuff to their song, but again, it just works perfectly for for that theme and for these guys. So um, again, all time great theme and, and and just Nash is on a roll here, man. He's got two. He's back to back, like just great, great theme song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a way to make it even more obnoxious and heelish. Like it's not enough that the song plays just over and over and over again every show, but they have to remind you that they're the NWO. They're in control. They're the icons of wrestling. They're for life. It's almost like since the NWO is this separate entity from WCW, it's like they're an army doing psychological warfare on their enemies. You know, resistance is futile, so join us or lose. And considering how many t-shirts they sold, I think it worked out quite well for them. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) for sure. Um, (laughs) You know, it also came to mind, actually. Uh, The song is made up of Hendrix riffs. That was a precursor to Hogan coming out to Voodoo Child in 97. So a cool little foreshadowing there. Yeah, I was always wondering when that that officially happened. So that was 97 that he started coming out to, to, to Voodoo Child? Yeah, yeah. Voodoo Chili, as Mike Tanay would call it. So, Yeah, so in 98, the NWO splinters in half. On one side, you had NWO Hollywood in the black and white with Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, The Disciple, Buff Bagwell, Vincent. Okay, not the best team in the world, I think. But <laughs> Messier with Chono, I guess. No, I don't know where he was. I don't know where Chono was. I don't think he He, he was in Japan somewhere, I think. He, he was doing okay there. But um, on the other side of the coin... You had the coolest motherfuckers on the planet, the NWO Wolfpack in the black and red, with Kevin Nash, Sting, Lex Luger, Randy Savage, Conan, Kurt Hennig, and the Wolfpack theme, which Nash would use as his singles theme for the remainder of his WCW run, is by Jimmy Hart and Howard Helm, featuring our old pal from No Limit Records, C. Murder. This is from WWE, the music of WCW. It's Wolfpack. Eight songs, Rich, but we finally got some hip hop. Now it's Jimmy Hart and Howard Helm doing hip hop, sure, but you know, see <laughs> murder is there to give it some credibility, so we're okay. Um, what a smart thing to do to distinguish between the NWO Hollywood and the NWO Wolfpack, because obviously the Wolfpack are going to need their own theme song, but instead of doing like another rock song, they go to a whole new genre here with hip hop with a guy from No Limit Records. It's cool, it's relevant, it's a fresh sound. C Murder had an album called Life or Death that went to number three in the Billboard charts. So it's just a really smart decision on WCW's part to make the babyface wolf pack its own thing. And definitely the cooler side of the NWO split with this song, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 like you said, it, it, it perfectly encapsulates how much cooler the wolf pack is. Because the NWO theme was like really, really good, and like we said, it was, it was awesome, and it like totally was perfect for that t- team in 1996 and 1997 or whatever. But by 1998, they had gotten a little long in the tooth, and like they said, they ne- they needed kind of a new, fresh coat of paint. And this Wolfpack song comes on, and it's like these are the coolest dudes in the universe. I mean, this is like you got C Murder in there. No Limit Records is as big as it's ever been. Hip hop is becoming even more mainstream than ever uh, at this point, and it's just it's a really, really good theme too. It like. I just love, I just absolutely love how, and you said it there too, and it's in the notes, Jimmy Hart and Howard Helm 
featuring sea murder. I am just like, my brain cannot get over the fact that Jimmy Hart of the Gentries got into a recording studio with sea murder and was like, all right, baby, let's come do on, it. Baby, let's on, go. Come, come on. on. Like, that's good, man. Let's do it one more time, baby. One more time, baby. Push the bass line up, baby. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> turn your treble up. Turn your treble up, baby. <laughs> just like, I'm just like, the idea, like, I just want, uh, with somebody, I, somebody has to have documentary footage of that, right? Like, that man, imagine Jimmy Hart and sea murder in the same room making music and it, works it's perfect like you t- people can talk about aerosmith and run dmc all they want i don't care the real blend of the, the, <laughs> the biggest blend of genre ever with jimmy Hart of the gentries and sea murder coming together to make this incredible wolf pack they mean the beat rules i'm get i, I guess it was jimmy Hart and howard helm that came with the beat if so could, kudos to them it's a good ass beat sea murder comes with some some great you know, rhyming as well it just it works man it's such a good theme and yeah it's just it, it's you know, I, I putting myself in 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 that time period, eleven year old me. I was already super into hip hop at this point too. It's pretty much the, the the my number one genre of music at this point. I was into wrestling. I liked Kevin Nash. I liked the NWO, and now this Wolfpack comes out, and dude, I was all in. Like this was, I, I thought this was the greatest collection of talent ever. It was Kevin Nash, K Dog, Lex Luger was there too. And like in hindsight, it's like Lex Luger and Kevin Nash wearing FUBU. It's like the <laughs> lamest thing in the world. You know what I mean? Like in, in retrospect, like most things in 1998 and 1999, you're like, oh God, how lame was that? Like why did I like that? Like why did I have frosted tips? Why did I wear Puka Shell necklaces or whatever? But right. like <laughs> at the time there was nothing better, man. And they just it, it's perfect of its time. And I really do think a tremendous theme. Like it, it's still where like I won't lie. You, you put this, you know, in our document. I, I listened to it. I listened to the song for like 20 minutes straight, you know, the other day. I was like working on something for work and I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to listen to the Wolfpack theme on repeat. It's still, all these years later, it's still a really, really good song. So so kudos to them. I really think it's it, it, it's tremendous. Yeah, it still conveys the badassery and the coolness of the Wolfpack. It just does it with the hip-hop lyrics and beats. Yeah, um, right, And the right. wolf howl at the beginning too. And I find the way that C Murder raps rather interesting because he doesn't do it in an overly aggressive manner or even like a standard like hip-hop rhythm like it's much smoother and more laid back and it just it flows so casually from one line to the next and the rhyming scheme is equally as lackadaisical you might say <laughs> or which... not existent <laughs> whatever you might say. <laughs> okay, which is fine okay. it's, it's cool but like you said it's like they like wheeled sea murder in here and he was just like Guess who's here? Bad boys are wrestling, just in competition, you know, the war just and, and like he just kind of saying words, but it works. It works for the song and it works for like you said. It, it you know, it kind of works for Kevin Nash too. It's lazy, it's lazily That's my put point, together, yes. but it rules. Like, right, it's perfect. And of course, it being Jimmy Hart, it's a ripoff of a song. Uh the song is Burned by Militia, <laughs> which is a song that the Wolfpack would come out to on the house shows, actually, because Fuck it, why not? It's a house show, right? I mean, that's, that's the Kevin Nash way. He probably, and... he, he probably told him that. He's probably like, hey man, just come out with it, who cares? Like, who gives a shit, man? And they're like, well, that we're going to get in legal trouble. He's like, it's house show, man, who fucking cares? And they're like, alright, whatever. Because remember back on the Hip Hop Themes Volume 2 episode, we talked about Scott Hall using Ready or Not by the Fugees. Him and Nash would come out to that song on the house shows. Right, yeah, Again, yeah, yeah. arbitrary house show bullshit from Kevin Nash. There's a pattern there, Rich. <laughs> what, a, what a legend. Now, uh, we, we can't praise this song too much because it, it did open the door for the No Limit Soldiers to come in with Hootie Who. Yeah. So, so it's not totally perfect. But then again, who amongst us isn't, right? Come on. So uh, as I said earlier in the episode, uh, WCW closes up shop in 01. And Kevin Nash waits out his AOL Time Warner contract. And then at the beginning of 2002, he rejoins WWE and reforms the NWO with Hogan and Hall. And then various other people later on. And that doesn't really go so well because it ends with Scott Hall being fired for quote-unquote demons and Nash tearing his quad running across the ring. So the NWO is gone, Nash is on the shelf, and 2003 rolls around and Shawn Michaels and Booker T, they need some help fighting Triple H and his evolution goons. Well, here he comes to save the day. It's the returning Kevin Nash, fresh from injury, with a brand new theme song. This is by Jim Johnston off of WWE Uncaged 4. It's called Jackknife.
Smithers, get me Diesel Blues. Uh, we can't, sir. Kevin Nash isn't Diesel anymore. Then get me its non-Union Mexican equivalent. I mean, all due respect to Jim Johnston here, but he's not exactly reinventing the wheel with this new song here, you know? Not quite breaking new ground. He's basically taking Diesel Blues, re-recording it with a few note changes here and there, putting an organ into the mix, and then, boom, here you go, a new Kevin Nash theme. I mean, there's not much else to say about it, really, because... We already covered it with Diesel Blues. I mean, it's the same song pretty much, Rich. Yeah, it's the same song, but like somehow worse. Like I don't, I don't understand. Like Jim Johnson, especially at this time, he seemed to have kind of lost his fastball uh, a little bit, and that would kind of continue for the the next few years. I think where Johnson just seemed like he had kind of regressed into like one style, and this kind of fits that. It's like you take Diesel Blues, but then you kind of have to add like some weird crunchy rock to it that's not really necessary at all, and that's kind of what I feel with the song. It's it's like it tries so hard to be Diesel Blues, but it doesn't want to be Diesel Blues. So it just ends up sounding like a, a theme that would like Mark Jindrak would get or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it, there's just no character to it and no real. I, I don't know. It, it, yeah, I, I it, not one of Jim Johnson's finest moments, unfortunately. I mean, to be fair to him, there probably weren't a lot of options to make a new Kevin Nash theme because he could do the Diesel Blues ripoff here, which he did. He could do a new hard rock song, which probably would have been just as run of the mill and forgettable as this one is. Or he could do a Wolfpack style hip hop theme, maybe, but. I don't think Jim Johnston was keen on copying WCW music trends anyway. So this is kind of the only option he can go with, really, for a Kevin Nash theme that, you know, at least ties into the backstory of him being Diesel, but is meant to be looking for a new era of Kevin Nash. But yeah, it's definitely not as good or memorable as Diesel Blues is, for sure. And it didn't last that long either because he left WWE after a few months anyway, so... It probably fits that run, you know, pretty perfectly. It's it's like a completely forgettable theme that like it's best left just not even <laughs> remembered or, or said ever again. Which like there's times where I'll, I'll I'll see like you know the Kevin Nash run in those days, and I'm like, oh yeah, like or I'll watch like Elimination Chamber, and I'm like, oh right, like Kevin Nash was there for like a few years, and why it's it's yeah. So um, I guess it fits in that period where where it's just like this completely forgettable Nash period as well. So. Well, Kevin Nash's second run in WWE ends, and he goes away for a little bit to uh, film the Punisher movie and get neck surgery. And where does he show up next in November of 2004? A little place called Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, where he forms yet another stable called the Kings of Wrestling. No, not with Chris Hero and Claudio Castagnoli, but with Jeff Jarrett and Scott Hall. And the stable doesn't last very long because Scott Hall is still dealing with his... Um, demons, shall we say. So he leaves TNA soon after, and then Nash turns face and starts feuding with Jeff Jarrett. So Nash's first singles theme in TNA is by, of course, Dale Oliver. It's called Dre. <laughs> So we're going back to the hip-hop well with this one, because this is an instrumental remake of Still Dre by Dr. Dre featuring Snoop Dogg. Not the most exciting theme in the world, because it's just those two piano chords over and over again, and a basic drum fill and some strings in the background. Kind of reminds me of like a GTA loading screen in a way, where it's just, you know, a basic piece of music to hold you over till the game starts. So, Wolfpack theme, it ain't rich. <laughs> no, this is, uh... I think I hate it more than you. I, I think it's kind of an abomination. It, to <laughs> me, it kind of sounds like some like terrible like Asher Roth remix of Still Dre that like you'd have to endure at like a college house party or something like that where like people think it's good and you're like it's man the song's not good guys. Like I know that it's like got a beat that like seems you know approachable and and decent, but it's really not. I mean, I guess as a standalone song, it's 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 fine, I guess, but it's like way too cheery and way too happy. For someone like Nash, like compare this to like Wolfpack. Like you said, Wolfpack feels like it's cool and these guys are going to beat the hell out of you. Does this song see, sound like a guy's going to beat the hell out of you? 
Like this song, it, it's just, it's too bright. It's too happy. It's too, I don't know. It's, it's, it, ah, yeah, not, not, not one of Dale Oliver's finest at all. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of this and a pretty, a pretty bad remake of Still Dre in my mind. It just, yeah, it just doesn't hit at that same level t- to me, so. Yeah, I mean, I can sort of see the intentions of it where they're trying to harken back to the Wolfpack theme with the hip hop genre mm-hmm. and maybe trying to present Kevin Nash as like this, you know, OG cool guy like Dr. Dre is. But again, this is not the Wolfpack theme. This is just some simple hip hop beat. And I think you need more than just that to make Kevin Nash and hip hop work. You need a more complete hip hop song with lyrics and such like the Wolfpack theme. Right, right, right. You know, it's essential that you're a part of this. I need you there December 10th. I think you've got something that some of these other guys don't have. I'm also a little worried about you, psychological aspect. That's why we're going to do the old inkblot test. I'll show you these. You tell me what it appears to be to you. What do you see? Warrior. That kind of looks like me holding the X Division title. A lot of energy. That's uh, Chrissy Hemi. Warrior. My heart after you broke it. So, Jay, have you ever uh, actually administered a lethal injection? Have you ever been to Fire Island? I actually have a summer home there. Thanks for asking. That's definitely me with the uh, world title. PlayStation 3. I was thinking more like a hippo's mandible. Warrior. I showed you all five of these, and every time you say warrior, are you going to tell me for one second that that doesn't, to some degree, look like Jim Helwick? As a child, did you ever play, I don't know, doctor? Well, a couple times, you know, here and there. <laughs> you know, I don't know how you did it. But I know you're dirty. I know you're on steroids. What? Why? You're, what? you're on no, anabolic. No, 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 no. You're a gas head. No, 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 no. You're a gas head. No, 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 no. What's this look what? like? What? What's this look like? Testosterone? No, What's no, this no, look no, like, no. huh? No, no, no. The juice? It's an ambush. What's this, huh? This huh? is an ambush. Berry Bonds? Ah, what? What? I can't take it. What? I gotta go. So Nash takes some more time off due to health issues, and he comes back in April 2006 to take part in one of my favorite storylines ever, which is Kevin Nash and the X Division, with Alex Shelley and Paparazzi Productions and all those great segments with with Sanjay and Jay Lethal, the Paparazzi Championship Series, of course. He got a brand new theme song, too. Uh, This is by Dale Oliver, and it's called Saturn. So first of all, another fun fact for you, uh, the reason this is called Saturn is because before Kevin Nash used it, it was used by Perry Saturn, TNA. So there you go. Um, Yeah, if you're at least a casual fan of classic rock, you would know this riff. Uh, This is a ripoff of the song Cashmere by Led Zeppelin, which is one of my favorite Zeppelin songs ever. And it's a really good choice, I think, for a wrestling theme because that riff is so memorable and so powerful. And there's this feeling of like, you know, impending doom to it all as well with the rising melody, you know, da na na da na na It's like there's this large force coming closer and closer towards you, and then it all comes crashing down. da 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 And it especially works for, like, a, a big wrestler, too, like Kevin Nash. So I think pairing Nash with this cashmere rough-off is a, a very good choice, much better than the Dre song is, uh, Rich. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like this song a lot. I, I think it, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's exa- It's like a one-for-one one remake of Casher, <laughs> basically, which, you know, it's fine. It's, it, you know, and, and I think, yeah, it absolutely works for Kevin Nash. Like you said, it, it has the it has the beat of, of, like, of what you would assume a Kevin Nash entrance would be like, a lot like Diesel Blues, where it kind of does fit uh, with, with, like you said, the, the way he's walking to the ring, the kind of the slowness at the beginning of the song. But then when it comes down, like, yeah, you see it perfectly. The second he, you know, puts that the big leg up and walks over the top rope or whatever is like when the big part of the song comes on or whatever. So, yeah, I think it works perfectly uh, for Kevin Nash. And I think a much better, uh, much better than Dre 
Um, but yeah, there's not much else to say about it. It's like, again, it's like a one-for-one -one remake of Cashmere, so it's not like, you know, we need to really judge it on any level other than, like, yeah, it, it, it achieved exactly what it needed to achieve or what it wanted to achieve, and yeah, I like it a lot. And I think with Nash, there's the age factor, too, because Cashmere came out in the mid-70s, it's an older song, and no offense to Kevin Nash, but at the same time as this, he was 45, 46, which is an old man in wrestling years, so I think giving him this song just sounds like it, it fits him better in this context and in time period than Dre does, you know. He comes off a lot more believable with this song, Rich. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the final Kevin Nash theme we'll talk about is one that he got in June 2007. And he had this for the remainder of his TNA run uh, until he left at the uh, end of 2010. And uh, I forgot to bring this up earlier, but it's pretty interesting to me that Nash had multiple dedicated singles themes in, in early WCW, WWE, TNA, but he never had one in peak NWO WCW. Like, he just came out to the Rock House or Wolfpack themes, and he never had a song back then that said, this is the Kevin Nash singles theme. You know, right, just right. A little side note there that I couldn't help but, but pick up on. But um, uh, anywho, uh, Nash had this theme for the rest of his TNA run, which includes the Samoa Joe tag team, the main event mafia, the world elite, the band, and then the tag team with Sting at the very end. And this theme of course, also by Dale Oliver, is called Strut. I think what we have here is the very rare double ripoff theme because <laughs> this is just an updated version of Saturn with new little bits and bobs added in and a wailing guitar sound wow, here and there. So not only is this a ripoff of Cashmere, but Dale Oliver is ripping off Jim Johnston by remaking his own song. So bravo, Dale, for accomplishing this feat, I guess. So Yeah, my note just says this was Dale Oliver's best impression of Jim Johnson doing a remake of Dale Oliver's remake of Cashmere. <laughs> it's basically what it was. Like, like Jim Johnson was like, hey, that remake of Cashmere is pretty good. Here, I'm going to remake it. And then Dale Oliver's like, that's a really good remake of my remake of Cashmere. Like, let me try to remake. And it's just like, it's fine, but it's just like, yeah, there's so many layers of like, I just, it, it, and he used this theme for a long time too. And, and I don't know if he necessarily needed it. Like, I think Saturn was pretty good. I see why they changed it and I see why they did the difference. And, and, and I do, you know, kind of appreciate Dale Oliver's attempt here. But it, it is very strange that it's just like a remake of a remake, seemingly of a remake. So, yeah, it, it's, it's well done. Like, I like it and I think it works for Kevin Nash. But it's, yeah, what, what else do you really say about it? Yeah, my notes are just, that's it. That's all I got for the song. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Nothing else yeah. to say about it, really. But, um, but yeah, those were uh, Nash's TNA themes, the main themes he had in TNA, and after that he left to go back to WWE. Uh, he did the Diesel return at the Royal Rumble in 2011, where uh, Matt Stryker was marking out, bro! And then he became Kevin Nash again to make sporadic appearances uh, here and there, including uh, that delightful hijacking of the Summer of Punk angle, mm. which somehow led to the classic sledgehammer ladder match with Triple H, which was just so good. <laughs> what, so did, what did the text message say? Because there was like a text message going around. Didn't it say stick them? What was the... What I was got the... a text that said stick the winner. <laughs> stick the winner. God. Oh, my God. Oh, the summer of punk. What could have been? You know what's weird? There have been times in my life where I've had like wrestling precognition where I can predict like random wrestling stuff that's going to happen. And that match at SummerSlam 2011, Punk versus Cena for the title, with Triple H as a special guest referee, I remember thinking beforehand, you know, what if Kevin Nash shows up here and powerbombs CM Punk? And he did! It happened! <laughs> right. Like, this is completely ridiculous. <laughs> right, this is so ridiculous. But it's so weird. Right. I mean, you've either yeah, you've either got a gift or this curse of wrestling has has infiltrated your brain so much that you're you're thinking that way. But yeah, I don't I don't know what to tell you. Uh, that's um, I'm sorry that 
your intuition came true in that one. I really, <laughs> I really wish it had. I don't know if you've spoken into existence or what happened, but good just Lord. so you know, I did not predict the Sledgehammer ladder match. Okay, that, that's not <laughs> right. on me. That's not on me. <laughs> you didn't predict that Summer Punk would end when Kevin Nash and, and Triple H had a ladder match. So <laughs> no, I also did not predict Triple H beating CM Punk clean at Night of Champions. <laughs> Uh, that's a terrible year yeah just just watch money in the big 2011 and just say ah turn it yes. off just, just turn it <laughs> right. off turn it off and just kind of in your head say ah yeah what a great summer that was and then turn it off and never think about it again assume indeed it was a great summer it was great everybody i promise just don't watch it ever cm punk blew the kiss to vince and they all lived happily ever after yes he put the title in the fridge and that was it <laughs> <laughs> yes. That he went to Ring of Honor or something. I don't know. Yeah, I forget what he did next, but who cares? Well, those were the themes of Kevin Nash. And, uh, you know, bringing it back to the beginning here. Yes, Nash, he's a very polarizing figure. You know, he's caused a lot of headaches over the years with his Kevin Nash bullshit. But he's also given a lot of good times, too. You know, for every bit of backstage politicking or for every boring stinkeroo match, there was a really funny X Division skit, like the Paparazzi Championship Series, or a neat-looking jackknife powerbomb, or a fun story from a shoot interview, or just something as cool as coming out to the Wolfpack theme and looking like a badass. So Nash, yes, he absolutely has his annoying faults. I will not deny that at all. But there's good in there too, more than some may give credit for. And I think you need to keep that good stuff in mind and appreciate it when talking about a conflicting, bullshitty kind of guy like Kevin Nash, which I certainly do. So what about you, Rich? Any final thoughts on Nash? Yeah, like, he's a guy that I think as I've kind of grown as a wrestling fan, I've come to appreciate a little bit more. Like, he's he's a guy that, like, yeah, as I said, in my early days of watching wrestling, really cool. It's like, hey, everybody tells me this guy's cool. He's cool. And then in, like, the NWO, he was actually cool. And in the Wolfpack, to me, he was actually cool. And then as I got a little older, got a little smarky, I'm on the old message boards, and I'm like, eh, this guy sucks. <laughs> like, you know, he's got his work rate isn't good. And he called my guys I like vanilla midgets. I And, like, all that was true. Like, I, then I started kind of hating this guy and thinking, oh, my God, he's terrible. He's awful or whatever. The runs in WWE didn't help. The, the You know, the runs when he comes back and he moves and his quad blows or whatever. Or he's on every shoot interview, you know, kind of putting down, you know, your Malinkos and your Eddie Guerreros of the world and those sort of guys. Uh, then I kind of roll my eyes and, and, and dislike that. But as you've kind of seen, you know, the past few years, I've come to kind of appreciate him a little more. When I go back and watch his stuff, I know what I'm getting out of Kevin Nash. I know what he's intending to do, and it it works. I mean, you can't mess with the success. Like, the success of Kevin Nash, it, it speaks for itself. That guy came in the WWF, took that place over like a, you know, you know, he came in, took it like a storm. I mean, like you said, he basically became a triple crown champion within a year, <laughs> you know, in a year's time, he's winning all those titles and he goes to WCW plays a huge role in the NWO. And like, yeah, it's not all makes, it's not all great, but yeah, sometimes you just like seeing this dude go in there, have a real lazy eight minute match, drop a guy in his head with the, the jackknife and walk out. And you're like, yeah, perfect. And, and I've come to appreciate him a little bit more. And maybe it's because like the, the human behind Kevin Nash, the human behind diesel and all that, seems like a kind of cool dude too. Like you follow him on Twitter and stuff and you're like, wow, this guy is like a lot cooler than you would think this guy is. And, and you kind of appreciate the laziness. Like as you get older and as you become an adult, you're like, you know, I wish I was really lazy. <laughs> like <laughs> I wish I was lazy and just made a lot. Cause like, I feel like I like work harder than I, I probably need to at times. And I'm wondering like, why do I, why don't I, why don't I, that's more like Kevin Nash. Like that's a dude who makes more money than most people to do the least amount of work. And it's like, yeah, you know, you, you, you come to appreciate it a bit. It's the dream. It's the dream. Um, it's funny. There's another story from that Young Bucks shoot interview where uh, they're on an indie show with Nash one time, and Nash does his match. And then afterwards, the promoter goes up to Nash, and it's like, I want you to do a run-in on some other match and hit the jackknife powerbomb on some guy. And Nash was like, yeah, I'll do it for an extra five grand. And the promoter paid the five grand, and he did it. And it's like, yep, that's Kevin Nash. As, as savvy and as smartly lazy guy as you can find. Oh, yeah. I saw him at an indie show uh, a few years ago, and he came in, and I, I think was, <laughs> my, my, my buddy was really excited about watching Kevin Nash, and I was like, ah, reel it in there. He's, you know, I, I don't know what he's, you know. And he comes in, and it's exactly like you think. He walks in, a guy runs into the ring, this guy all but throws his head into Kevin Nash's, you know, <laughs> mid section, his, his nether regions. And Kevin Nash does the laziest jackknife you've ever seen. Says, All right, big sexy Kevin Nash. All right. Then just leaves. <laughs> like, this is incredible. And then I heard that, like, he went in the back, he watched one match. One of the guys had a match. He goes, You got to slow down, kid. No one's going to, you know, no one's going to appreciate you going that fast or whatever. 
And like, it wasn't that fast. Like this guy, the guy that's wrestling, like I, I, I'm not going to name names or whatever, but not like we're not talking. about It wasn't Phoenix, like you know what I mean. Yeah. It, like, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't really, Masato like, Yoshino I mean, here. You yeah, know, so. exactly. Right. And, like it was, you know, I, it was a pretty slow, you know, paced match or whatever. And then apparently Nash just like yeah walked out the back door and left and just you know just that that was it. He, he walks in, gives the laziest jackknife ever. Goes to the back, gives one match advice, then walks out and 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 you know probably got paid you know ten thousand dollars or something <laughs> to do it. So, God, I just appreciate that man so much. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right, well that's gonna do it for this episode of Music of the Mat. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, Rich, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know you're a busy man nowadays with the flagship and the side projects, and I know the nurse is working your ass off in the hospitals because of coronavirus. So. It's a busy time in the Creech household, that's for sure. And I do want to give just a, a really big thank you to you for, for making time to come on here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is a blast. Any Anytime. Anytime you want to head me on for Music of the Mad, I am uh, I am into it. The only thing that sucks, and I say this every time I, I do an episode of the Music of the Mad, is like I never want to hear myself. So now there's going to be like one Music of the Mad that comes out that I'm not going to listen to. And I'm just like, man. So now I have like a <laughs> gap in my Music of the Mad uh, listening. So maybe I'll go back and listen to a classic episode. They're, they're pretty evergreen. So, you know. You yeah, for the most part. Sure. It, so. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've got a bunch of plugs to give, so go right ahead. Yeah, let's do that. So you, you mentioned at the top the uh, In Your House, In Your House series. That's going to be done at uh, VoicesWrestling.com slash Patreon. Uh, it's our $5 tier unlocks the In Your House series as well as a lot of the other stuff that we're doing. Uh, the Joe Vember to Remember series that Joe Lanza does. Uh, a lot of the written, you know, a lot of the other content that we're doing on that as well. The deep dive you can get for 5 bucks. So there's a lot of great stuff you can get for 5 bucks. Uh, we also have a $10 tier if you want to listen to the uh, Voice Wrestling flagship live. Uh, every time we record it, every single week we record it, you can listen live. Uh, also, that gets you uh, access to live instant reaction and a bunch of other stuff uh, that we're doing as well on the uh, $10 tier. But yeah, voicewrestling.com slash Patreon. Uh, we, you know, it, it, again, like as, as Andrew, as you mentioned, like times are tough for people. You know, money is is tight. So any support that people give us is, is, is super appreciated. And it's been awesome to see uh, the, the the outpouring of support that we've had for that. And 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 more than anything, though, VoicesWrestling.com as well. I mean, you're listening to this, hopefully, on the Voice of Wrestling, uh, you know, podcast network, I should say. Uh, but if you're not subscribing, a ton of other great podcasts on the podcast network uh, as well. A ton of other great stuff going on at Voices of Wrestling. Like, one thing I will say is that, like, there's a lot less wrestling going on. There's not as much, you know things to get excited about but our podcast network has not missed a beat i mean people are going back and watching old stuff people are covering new aspects of wrestling that have never been covered before i mean there's a lot of great stuff going on including this show uh as well so the voice wrestling podcast network make sure you subscribe there uh voice wrestling.com and then uh yeah yeah voice of wrestling.com slash patreon to uh show your support uh for us uh, additionally as well but uh andrew really really do appreciate you having me on here oh it's always a blast when you're on here for sure definitely and uh, I'll just say that you can follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Mat. You can follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. Check out the VOW Discord at VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord. If you want to donate to the show, uh, you can do that. Um, I know times are tough right now, but if you want to do it, you can go to VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Donate and click the big Donate button beneath the name Music of the Mat. Uh, rate, review, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. And um, before we uh, get out of here, um, I, I do want to take a few seconds to talk about something that's uh, pretty serious. Um, we're recording this on Wednesday, May 20th, and a few days uh, prior to this, uh, me, Rich, um, everybody at Voices of Wrestling, and, and really everybody in the online wrestling world at large, uh, were stunned and saddened to hear about the death of Larry Zonka. Um, if you don't know who Larry was, he was a longtime wrestling reviewer for 411mania.com, and he was, uh, without question, the hardest working wrestling reviewer I've ever known in my life. I mean, if there was a televised wrestling show on, a pay-per-view, a network special, uh, a, a YouTube show, an iPay-per-view, uh, some random like New Japan Roto show at like 4 in the morning or whatever, by the time that it was over, if you went to 411mini.com, chances are Larry had a review up and ready to go just like that. I mean, he was just a machine when it came to his work ethic, and we didn't have that many interactions over the years, uh, maybe a couple here and there on Twitter, but even so, it was still clear to me, and clear to everybody really who knew him, that Larry was just a very nice guy, a very hardworking guy, someone who was liked by everybody, who, you know, given that it's the internet, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, so <laughs> yeah. kudos to him for that, but, um, but yeah, Larry was just someone who just, he loved wrestling so much, only thing he loved more was, of course, his family, and his children, and my heart and my good thoughts and my good vibes go out to them completely. Um, Rich, I, I know you and Joe will probably give your own thoughts and, and words on Larry, 
on the flagship, but I just wanted to, you know, take the time to say a few words about him as we wrap up here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larry, Larry is incredible. And, and, and we will we'll, we'll take some time on the flagship this week to do it. We also have a uh, article up at uh, voicewrestling.com uh, called Remembering Larry Zonka, which uh, is, you know, various contributors uh, to the website all gave, you know, quick little thoughts uh, on what Larry meant to them and how important he was. And it was cool that, like, there were so many different stories that people told uh, about him and, and, and how important he was to, you know, their reading or their wrestling consumption or their, you know, careers in writing or their, you know, inspiration to write and all that sort of stuff. So it's really, really cool. Uh, to, to, to read that stuff. And yeah, Larry, I mean, it, it, he, he was an avid, you know, voices wrestling listener. I, I, I'm, I'm sure he listened to music of the mad. I'm sure he listened to almost every podcast uh, that we did on this network. And yeah, almost from like the early days too. And that's what I'll always remember is like, he didn't have to, he would retweet this website all the time. Like, and, and he didn't have to, I mean, he was a big deal. He was a giant deal in, uh, you know, in, in, in the wrestling review uh, world, but he always took a little bit of time uh, to, to shout us out or help us out or, or do whatever he needed to do. But yeah, he's uh, like you said, the work that work ethic is incredible. Like I, I unmatched unmatched in wrestling and, and we'll all try to get that work ethic. We'll all try to, you know, inspire to do that, but there's no way that we're ever going to reach that work. Ethic. It's like, like you said, like a road to show would end at, and, and this would be, you know, the ninth road to show in a row that new Japan has aired because they just said, Hey, fuck it, throw up a camera and, and let the show happen. And you'd wake up and, or you'd be watching it live. And two minutes after the show, there's Larry Zonka's review. And you're like, what the hell? Like, how is he doing that? <laughs> and then like later that night, he's watching WWE main event. And you're like, Larry, stop watching main event. What are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? But he just, if, 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 if it was wrestling, he reviewed it. And like, I, I mentioned how long he was in the, in the game too. Like I remember back in 2003, 2004, reading his stuff. And like, it's a lifetime. And like you said, to be around the internet for that long, and to have pretty much everybody, 99.9% of people like you, like, I don't know anybody that said the bad word about Larry. Maybe it's 100%. It might be 100%. I mean, that's unbelievable. No, Nobody's that way. Everybody hates everybody. <laughs> you know? Yeah, in that so. uh, memorial article, I wrote about um, not really a story, uh, more of a tradition, really, where... It would be like a New Japan, you know, World Tag League Night 74 or whatever at 5 <laughs> in the morning. And, and without fail, Larry would post on Twitter the gif from Ash vs. Evil Dead of Lucy Lawless rising up out of the fire pit as a message to people saying, you know, I am up and I'm watching this. And it's like, Larry, you just reviewed like three shows yesterday, you know, what are you doing here? This can wait. But that was Larry. You know, he wanted to watch wrestling and he did. And, and I do want to mention this as well. Um, if you want to help out Larry's family and help them pay for expenses and stuff like that, uh, there is a GoFundMe page set up. It's called Larry Mania. Uh, there's a link to it in the VW article. I'll put a link to it in the description of the episode as well. So you can go there and give as much as you can to help out. And it's interesting. We talked about how you know everybody loved Larry. There have been a ton of donations so far. And I've seen wrestlers donate. I've seen wrestling reviewers donate, wrestling podcasters from all over, you know, Larry was like this great uniter, you know, like like Cyrus from the Warriors, who was able to bring all these different <laughs> groups and, and clans together from different countries and websites. You know, it was just so remarkable to see all that and, and just see all this love and support for Larry. So, uh, yeah, check out the GoFundMe page. Um, I, I mean, it sucks that we even have to have one in the first place for this kind of stuff. Right. It's just it's terrible. But but yeah, give what you can help out as much as you can, because, you know, Larry was a hell of a guy and his family deserves the help. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. All right. Well, uh, Rich, uh, thank you again, and I'm sure I'll see you around. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. This was, uh, this was great, and uh, yeah, let's, let's do it again soon. All right. For Rich Creech, I'm Andrew Rich. Stay safe out there, and I will see you next time on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys. Music of the Mat is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders.